so guys welcome with another reaction with the toxic channel this one is really special because we're gonna have all the answer i was waiting for and i don't understand why nobody thought of interviewing putin only chris tucker it's not carlson sorry tucker carlson did it and it was dropped yesterday or before yesterday it's just a recent video so i wanted to do reaction to see how i'm going to react to it as a guy who was living there in ukraine and i would like to understand why this war started the reason and how it started and you cannot have all this answer from other rather than from him he's the guy who started everything this so let's dig in guys to see to have all the answer we wanted but first we start guys make sure to subscribe to our channel if you want to see have more and more uh, reaction to see you can send me links you can subscribe also to instagram and send me links we talk on instagram uh, I, I also put there in Instagram what uh, stories that I'm gonna watch reaction I'm going to do next and if you want to donate to help us have better equipment guys and uh, better quality videos as I guess so make sure to donate in the link in the description buy me a coffee you can donate how much you want no pressure guys no pressure Ooh, I'm lonely this winter Was sincere would you agree with sorry guys for the pause someone was knocking at the door so i had to answer uh let's check in guys it or not vladimir putin believes that russia has a historic claim to parts of western ukraine so our opinion would be to view it in that light as a sincere expression of what he well i would like to say this for all my russian subscriber guys i have nothing against russian i'm algerian I am an Algerian, African Algerian, so I have nothing against the Russian. But uh, this war that it started has no excuse, guys. And I wish you understand what does it mean for people who lost their home and stuff like this. So I'm gonna speak my mind. Maybe uh, four of you guys gonna understand it. Some of you will not, but I will speak my mind definitely, and I will say what I feel and uh, how I feel it and how I see it. You can give me feedbacks. There is nothing for hate. Uh, there is no hate here anyway. You can give me feedbacks how you felt it and how you see it. And we can go from there. We can uh, talk about different point of view. It's, it's going to be like not a debate, but it's going to be sharing opinion, guys. And with that, here it is. Mr. President, thank you. On February 22nd, 2022, you addressed your country in a nationwide address when the conflict <laughs> in Ukraine started. And you said that you were acting because you had come to the conclusion that the United States, through NATO, might initiate a, quote, surprise attack on our country. And to American ears, that sounds paranoid. Tell us why you believe the United States might strike Russia out of the blue. How did you conclude that? It's not that America, the United States, was going to launch a surprise strike on Russia. I didn't say that. Are we having a talk show or a serious conversation? <laughs> Here's the quote. <laughs> Thank you. It's a formidable serious talk. Because your basic education is in history as far as I understand. Yes. So if you don't mind, I will take only 30 seconds or one minute to give you a short reference to history for giving you a little historical background. Please. <coughs> Let's look where our relationship with Ukraine started from. Where did Ukraine come from? The Russian state started gathering itself as a centralized statehood and it is considered to be the year of the establishment of the Russian state in 862. 
when the townspeople of Novgorod invited a Varangian prince, Rurik, from Scandinavia to reign. In 1862, Russia celebrated the 1000th anniversary of its statehood. And in Novgorod, there is a memorial dedicated to the 1000th anniversary of the country. In 882, Rurik's successor, Prince Oleg, who was actually playing the role of regent at Rurik's young son, because Rurik had died by that time, came to Kiev. I was living in Kiev. He ousted two brothers, who apparently had once been members of Rurik's squad. So Russia began to develop with two centers of power, <coughs> Kiev and Novgorod. The next very significant date in the history of Russia was 988. This was the baptism of Russia, when Prince Vladimir, the great-grandson of Rurik, baptized Russia and adopted orthodoxy, or Eastern Christianity. From this time, the centralized Russian state began to strengthen. Why? Because of the single territory, integrated economic ties, one and the same language and, after the baptism of Russia, the same faith and rule of the prince. The centralized Russian state began to take shape. Back in the Middle Ages, Prince Yaroslav the Wise introduced the order of succession to a throne. But after he passed away, it became complicated for various reasons. The throne was passed not directly from father to eldest son, but from the prince, who had passed away to his brother, then to his sons in different lines. All this led to the fragmentation and the end of Rus as a single state. There was nothing special about it. The same was happening then in Europe. But the fragmented Russian state became an easy prey to the empire created earlier by Genghis Khan. His successors, namely Batu Khan, came to Rus, plundered and ruined nearly all the cities. The southern part, including Kiev, by the way, and some other cities simply lost independence, while northern cities preserved some of their sovereignty. They had to pay tribute to the horde, but they managed to preserve some part of their sovereignty. And then a unified Russian state began to take shape with its center in Moscow. The southern part of Russian lands, including Kiev. Me, I would speak this, guys. Uh, I'm a wise. I'm, 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 I am a wise guy who know what to say and know how to say it. So, before I say something, uh, I. I understand how I get these words out of my mouth to not offend nobody in the side. So I understand how to say it without offending nobody. That's I am good at. As part of a psychology, I am good at. And I would address this also. You have to understand when a guy like Putin speaking about why he did all what he did and the truth is in his mouth, you need to check him you don't need to hear from others what's going on with the word why this and this and this from other no you need to hear when you see an interview you see someone who started this you need to check him what he is saying because he is the mind of what happening and what he started he started it so you check him if you want to know the truth then check him if you don't want to know the truth, then stay with others and what they say, what they say and stuff like this. But I recommend you every time you want to have the truth, check it from the one who started that. It doesn't mean it's just him. Any other truth, you just need to check it from that person, not from others. The southern part of Russian lands, including Kiev, began to gradually gravitate towards another magnet, the center that was emerging in Europe. 
This was the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. It was even called the Lithuanian Russian Duchy because Russians were a significant part of this population. They spoke the old Russian language and were Orthodox. But then there was a unification, the union of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and the Kingdom of Poland. A few years later, another union was signed, but this time already in the religious sphere. Some of the Orthodox priests became subordinate to the Pope. Thus, these lands became part of the Polish-Lithuanian state. During decades, the Poles were engaged in Polonization of this part of the population. They introduced their language there, tried to entrench the idea that this population was not exactly Russians, that because they lived on the fringe, they were Ukrainians. Originally, the word Ukrainian meant that the person was living on the outskirts of the state along the fringes or was engaged in a border patrol service. It didn't mean any particular ethnic group. So the Poles were trying to, in every possible way, to polonize this part of the Russian lands and actually treated it rather harshly, not to say cruelly. All that led to the fact that this part of the Russian lands began to struggle for their rights. They wrote letters to Warsaw demanding that their rights be observed and people be commissioned here, including to Kiev. I beg your pardon, can you tell us what period, I'm losing track of where in history we are, the, the, the Polish oppression of Ukraine. It was in the 13th century. Now I will tell you what happened later and give the dates so that there is no confusion. And in 1654, <coughs> even a bit earlier, the people who were in control of the authority over that part of the Russian lands addressed Warsaw. I repeat, demanding that they send them to rulers of Russian origin and Orthodox faith. When Warsaw did not answer them and in fact rejected their demands, they turned to Moscow so that Moscow took them away. So that you don't think that I'm inventing things. I'll give you these documents. Well, I, I, it doesn't sound like you're inventing it. I'm, I'm not sure why it's relevant to what happened no, two no, years no. ago. But still, these are documents from the archives, copies. Here are the letters from Bogdan Khmelnytsky, the man who then controlled the power in this part of the Russian lands that is now called Ukraine. He wrote to Warsaw demanding that their rights be upheld and after being refused, he began to write letters to Moscow, asking to take them under the strong hand of the Moscow Tsar. There are copies of these documents. I will leave them for your good memory. There is a translation into Russian. You can translate it into English later. Russia would not agree to admit them straight away, assuming that the war with Poland would start. Nevertheless, in 1654, the Pan-Russian Assembly of top clergy and landowners headed by the Tsar, which was the representative body of the power of the old Russian state, decided to include a part of the old Russian lands into Moscow Kingdom. As expected, the war with Poland began. It lasted 13 years and then in 1654, a truce was concluded. And 32 years later, I think, a peace treaty with Poland, which they called Eternal Peace, was signed. And these lands, the whole left bank of Dnieper, including Kiev, went to Russia. And the whole right bank of Dnieper remained in Poland. Under the rule of Katharina the Great, Russia reclaimed all of its historical lands, including in the south and west. 
This all lasted until the revolution. Before World War I, Austrian general staff relied on the ideas of Ukrainianization and started actively promoting the ideas of Ukraine and the Ukrainianization. Their motive was obvious. Just before World War I, they wanted to weaken the potential enemy and secure themselves favorable conditions in the border area. So the idea which had emerged for the for, for the history that he is saying this all brand new to me i'm not a politician i'm not a historian i'm not a politician so i don't understand much about it but as i studied it in uh, in school i studied history but when you choose not to after you know high school you choose to which direction you want to go as i, I went as a psychologist i choose this uh, the sociology in general so uh, but I study in high school history, and they teach us about the Russian, about the German, about uh, the Americans, all, all of the history. But you have, about the Turkish, also the Ottoman Empire. They they teach us in general the history. But if you t decide not to go deep, so you will not go much more in the history. So you will not know. You have only like the surface. You know what I mean? So everything he's saying that's brand new to me. I didn't hear about them emerged in Poland that people residing in that territory were allegedly not really Russians, but rather belonged to a special ethnic group, Ukrainians, started being propagated by the Austrian general staff. As far back as the 19th century, theorists calling for Ukrainian independence appeared. All those, however, claimed that Ukraine should have a very good relationship with Russia. They insisted on that. After the 1917 revolution, the Bolsheviks sought to restore the statehood and the civil war began, including the hostilities with Poland. In 1921, peace with Poland was proclaimed, and under that treaty, the right bank of Dnieper River once again was given back to Poland. In 1939, after Poland cooperated with Hitler, oh yeah, it did uh, this one I know. With Hitler, you know? <coughs> yeah, I know. Hitler offered Poland peace and a treaty of friendship an alliance demanding in return that Poland give back to Germany the so-called Danzig Corridor, which connected the bulk of Germany with East Prussia and Königsberg. After World War I, this territory was transferred to Poland, and instead of Danzig, a city of Dansk emerged. Hitler asked them to give it amicably, but they refused. Of course. Still, they collaborated with Hitler and engaged together in the partitioning of Czechoslovakia. But may, may I ask you, you're making the case that, that Ukraine, certainly parts of Ukraine, Eastern Ukraine is in, in effect Russia has been for hundreds of years. Why wouldn't you just take it when you became president? 24 years ago. You have nuclear weapons, they don't. If it's actually your land, why did you wait so long? I'll tell you. I'm coming to that. This briefing is coming to an end. It might be boring, but it explains many things. I just don't know how it's relevant. Good. Good. I'm so gratified that you appreciate that. Thank you. So, before World War II, Poland collaborated with Hitler, and although it did not yield to Hitler's demands, it still participated in the partitioning of Czechoslovakia together with Hitler, as the Poles had not given the dance. Yeah, because I also understand that uh, I'm waiting for what he asked him as a question, but he's still uh, giving the history of side like he's giving the the whole history and the whole excuses like that oh this is uh, why we proclaim it right now you know, the whole excuse but the question is was so direct you know what i mean so i would like to understand the truth <laughs> why <laughs>
Atlantic Corridor to Germany had went so far, pushing Hitler to start World War II by attacking them. Oh. Why was it Poland against whom the war started on 1st September 1939? Poland turned out to be uncompromising and Hitler had nothing to do but start implementing his plans with Poland. It's, uh, so, thir 33, the I think 33, the 33 or 38, they elected Hitler, and then 38, 39, it started the World War Two, and it ended on 1945. I think that's. Poland. By the way, the USSR, I have read some archive documents, behaved very honestly. It asked Poland's permission to transit its troops through the Polish territory to help Czechoslovakia. But the then Polish foreign minister said that if the Soviet plans flew over Poland, they would be downed over the territory of Poland. <coughs> but that doesn't matter. What matters is that the war began, and Poland fell prey to the policies it had pursued against Czechoslovakia, as under the well-known Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Part of the territory, including western Ukraine, was to be given to Russia. Thus, Russia, which was then named the USSR, regained its historical lands. After the victory in the Great Patriotic War, as we call World War II, all those territories were ultimately enshrined as belonging to Russia, to the USSR. As for Poland, it received, apparently in compensation, the lands which had originally been German. The eastern parts of Germany, these are now western lands of Poland. Of course, Poland regained access to the Baltic Sea and Danzig, which was once again given its Polish name. So this was how this situation developed. In 1922, when the USSR was being established, the Bolsheviks started building the USSR and established the Soviet Ukraine, which had never existed before. Right. Stalin insisted that those republics be included in the USSR as autonomous entities. For some inexplicable reason, Lenin, the founder of the Soviet state, insisted that they be entitled to withdraw from the USSR. <coughs> and again, for some unknown reasons, he transferred to that newly established Soviet Republic of Ukraine some of the lands together with people living there, even though those lands had never been called Ukraine. And yet, they were made part of that Soviet Republic of Ukraine. Those lands included the Black Sea region, which was received under Catherine the Great, and which had no historical connection with Ukraine whatsoever. Even if we go as far back as 1654, when these lands returned to Russian Empire, that territory was the size of three to four regions of modern Ukraine, with no Black Sea region. That was completely out of the question. In 1654? Exactly. Well, I'm just, I, you obviously have encyclopedic knowledge of this region, but why didn't you make this case for the first 22 years as president that Ukraine wasn't a real country? The Soviet Union was given a great deal of territory that had never belonged to it, including the Black Sea region. At some point, when Russia received them as an outcome of the Russo-Turkish Wars, they were called New Russia or Novorossiya. But that does not matter. What matters is that Lenin, the founder of the Soviet state, established Ukraine that way. For decades, the Ukrainian Soviet Republic developed as part of the USSR. And for unknown reasons, again, the Bolsheviks were engaged in Ukrainianization. It was not merely because the Soviet leadership was composed to a great extent of those originating from Ukraine. Rather, it was explained by the general policy of indigenization pursued by the Soviet Union, 
Same things were done in other Soviet republics. This involved promoting national languages and national cultures, which is not a bad in principle. That is how the Soviet Ukraine was created. After the World War II, Ukraine received, in addition to the lands that had belonged to Poland before the war, part of the lands that had previously belonged to Hungary and Romania. So Romania and Hungary had some of their lands taken away and given to the Soviet Ukraine, and they still remain part of Ukraine. So in this sense, we have every reason to affirm that Ukraine is an artificial state that was shaped at Stalin's will. Do you believe Hungary has a right to take its land back from Ukraine? and that other nations have a right to go back to their 1654 <clears throat> borders? Good question. I'm not sure whether they should go back to the 1654 borders. But given Stalin's time, so-called Stalin's regime, which, as many claim, saw numerous violations of human rights and violations of the rights of other states, one may say that they could claim back those lands of theirs while having no right to do that. It is at least understandable. Have you told Viktor Orban that he can have part of Ukraine? Never. I have never told him. Not a single time. <coughs> we have not even had any conversation on that, but I actually know for sure that Hungarians who live there wanted to get back to their historical land. That's Moreover, new. I would like to share a very interesting story with you. I digress, it's a personal one. Somewhere in the early 80s, I went on a road trip in a car from then Leningrad across the Soviet Union through Kiev. Made a stop in Kiev and then went to western Ukraine. I went to the town of Beregovoye. And all the names of towns and villages there were in Russian and in a language I did not understand, in Hungarian in Russian and in Hungarian, not in Ukrainian, in Russian and in Hungarian. I was driving through some kind of village and there were men sitting next to the houses and they were wearing black three-piece suits and black cylinder hats. I asked, are they some kind of entertainers? I was told, no, they were not entertainers, they're Hungarians. I said, what are they doing here? What do you mean? This is their land, they live here. This was during the Soviet time in the 1980s. They preserved the Hungarian language, Hungarian names, and all their national costumes. They are Hungarians and they feel themselves to be Hungarians. And of course, when now there is an infringement. Well, that, that is, and there's a lot of that though. I think many nations are upset about Transylvania as well, as you obviously know. But many nations feel frustrated by the redrawn borders of the wars of the 20th century and wars going back a thousand years, the ones that you mentioned. But the fact is that you didn't make this case in public until two years ago, February. And in the case that you made, which I read today, you, you explain at great length that you felt a physical threat from the West in NATO, including potentially a nuclear threat, and that's what got you to move. Is that a fair characterization of what you said? I understand that my long speeches probably fall outside of the genre of the interview. That is why I asked you at the beginning, are we going to have a serious talk or a show? You said a serious talk, so bear with me, please. We are coming to the point where the Soviet Ukraine was established. Then, in 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed, and everything that Russia had generously bestowed on Ukraine was dragged away by the latter. I'm coming to a very important point of today's agenda. Thank you. After all, the collapse of the Soviet Union was effectively initiated by the Russian leadership. I do not understand what the Russian leadership was guided by at the time, but I suspect there were several reasons to think everything would be fine. 
First, I think that then Russian leadership believed that the fundamentals of the relationship between Russia and Ukraine were, in fact, a common language. More than 90% of the population there spoke Russian. Family ties. Every third person there had some kind of family or friendship ties. Common culture, common history. Finally, common faith, coexistence with a single state for centuries. You know, for two years after the war started, all the, uh, all the rules that they put against Russia, that's what it surprised me, like all the rules is against Russia, right? But why it didn't collapse? Everything is against her, right? Everything is against her. So all the rules, like no more businesses, no more this, no more this. But still, it didn't collapse. It's flourish. I didn't get it. Why it's flourishing? Well, it's supposed to be the opposite. Why it's flourishing and it's becoming the, the first economy in Europe. I didn't get it though. And like we see part in France, for example, France, what happened uh, last year. France lost Niger. Uh, Niger is, is African, but doesn't belong to France. But it was like on the rule of Macron, you know what I mean? And they lost it and they kick out the French. So all the uranium, all the uranium of in Niger, it was 60% of uranium going to France. It means all the supply of electricity and other energy from Niger. So he cut that. As we can saw the video in Russia and stuff like this. So he cut them. So how he cut them. And now France is in struggle. Don't see it right now. It's really in struggle, France. So I understand if you put all this against him, why he flourish? I want to have answers. I want to have answers. <laughs> I want to hear answers, bro. It's just history. I'm not good with history. I would like to have answers. <laughs> and deeply interconnected economies. All of these were so fundamental. All these elements together make our good relationships inevitable. The second point is a very important one. I want you as an American citizen and your viewers to hear about this as well. The former Russian leadership assumed that the Soviet Union had ceased to exist, and therefore there were no longer any ideological dividing lines. Russia even agreed voluntarily and proactively to the collapse of the Soviet Union and believed that this would be understood by the so-called civilized West as an invitation for cooperation and association. Oh. That is what Russia was expecting, both from the United States and the so-called collective West as a whole. There were smart people, including in Germany, Egon Barr, a major politician of the Social Democratic Party, who insisted in his personal conversations with the Soviet leadership on the brink of the collapse of the Soviet Union, that a new security system should be established in Europe. Help should be given to unify Germany, but a new system should be also established to include the United States, Canada, Russia and other Central European countries. Yes. But NATO needs not to expand. That's what he said. Okay. If NATO expands, everything would be just the same as during the Cold War, only closer to Russia's borders. That's all. He was a wise old man, but no one listened to him. In fact, he got angry once. If, he said, you don't listen to me, I'm never setting my foot in Moscow once again. Everything happened just as he had said. Yeah, well, it, of course, it did come true. And, I, and you've mentioned this many times. I think it's a fair point. And many in America thought yeah. that relations between... <coughs> Russia and the United States would be fine with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War, that the opposite happened. But you've never explained why you think that happened, except to say that the West fears a strong Russia, but we have a strong China the West does not seem very afraid of. Uh, what about Russia do you think convinced policymakers they had to 
take it down. The West is afraid of strong China more than it fears a strong Russia. That's true. Because Russia has 150 million people and China has 1.5 billion population and its economy is growing by leaps and bounds, or 5% a year. It used to be even more. But that's enough for China. As Bismarck once put it, potentials are the most important. China's potential is enormous. It is the biggest economy in the world today in terms of purchasing power parity and the size of the economy. It has already overtaken the United States quite a long time ago, and it is growing at a rapid clip. Let's not talk about who is afraid of whom, let's not reason in such terms. And let's get into the fact that after 1991, when Russia expected that it would be welcomed into the brotherly family of civilized nations, nothing like this happened. You tricked us. I don't mean you personally when I say you. Of course, I'm talking about the United States. The promise was that NATO would not expand eastward. But it happened five times. There were five waves of expansion. We tolerated all that. We were trying to persuade them. We were saying, please don't. We are as bourgeois now as you are. We are a market economy and there is no communist party power. Let's negotiate. Moreover, I have also said this publicly before. Okay, basically what he's saying right now, this information, I never heard it in my life. This is the first time I heard this information. But when uh, when the Ukrainian, uh, oh no, sorry, when the Russian invaded Ukraine, uh, I started hearing his speech again, like saying, I, I don't know who said it, maybe him, maybe other videos, I don't know how he said it, but he says that we stuck to the NATO to not expand, expand from the United States to not expand, if you expand we're gonna attack, so that was too much and stuff like this. This is the first time I heard it, and I heard it little, two years ago, was a but I didn't pay attention. A certain rift started growing between us. Before so, that, I would say this, uh, me, I'm reacting to this kind of thing because it's triggered me and it's really interesting to me. That, that's how I see things. I, it's interesting really to me because I don't want to hear it from third party, if you know what I mean. I don't want to hear third guy say, telling me how he think with his mind. For me, to think how he think. No, I don't want to think how he think. I want to think how I think and how I feel. I want to say what I think and what I feel. And how I see all the scenario, and I'm not afraid to speak what I am is in my mind. So, guys, and but I'm not a politician and I'm not a historian, so I don't know nothing about it. I I am like a white page, you know. So, but I would appreciate guys from you guys, Russian. That, no matter which country you are from, if you have an opinion about this, please write me. What do you think about this and why this is happening and what's the reason and stuff like this? Give me feedbacks, guys. A really interesting point for me to remember to know how to think to know how my opinion goes and why you said th- you said this and now i'm thinking like this this kind of things trigger my mind guys and came to the united states remember he spoke in congress and said the good words god bless america everything he said were signals let us in Remember the developments in Yugoslavia before the Yeltsin was lavished with praise? As soon as the developments in Yugoslavia started, he raised his voice in support of Serbs, and we couldn't but raise our voices for Serbs in their defense. I understand that there were complex processes on the way there, I do. But Russia could not help raising its voice in support of Serbs, because Serbs are also a special and close to us nation, with orthodox culture and so on. It's a nation that has suffered so much for generations. Well, regardless, what is important is that Yeltsin expressed his support. What did the United States do? In violation of international law and the UN Charter, it started bombing Belgrade. It was the United States that led the genie out of the bottle. Moreover, when Russia protested and expressed its resentment, what was said? The UN Charter and international law have become obsolete. Now everyone invokes international law, but at that time they started saying that everything was outdated. Everything had to be changed. Indeed, some things need to be changed, as the balance of power has changed. It's true, but not in this manner. Yeltsin was immediately dragged through the mud, accused of alcoholism, of understanding nothing, of knowing nothing. He understood everything, I assure you. Well. I became president in 2000. I thought, okay, the Yugoslav issue is over, but we should try to restore relations. 
Let's reopen the door that Russia years. has tried to go through. And moreover, I said it publicly, I can reiterate. At a meeting here in the Kremlin with the outgoing President Bill Clinton, right here in the next room, I said to him, I asked him, Bill, do you think if Russia asked to join NATO, do you think it would happen? Suddenly he said, you know, it's interesting, I think so. But in the evening, when we met for dinner, he said, you know, I've talked to my team, no, no, it's not possible now. You can ask him, I think he will watch our interview, he'll confirm it. I wouldn't have said anything like that if it hadn't happened. Okay, Were you well, sincere? it's impossible now. W would you have joined NATO? Look, I asked the question, is it possible or not? And the answer I got was no. If I was insincere in my desire to find out what the leadership position was... But if he had said yes, would you have joined NATO? Well, that's hypothetical. If he had said yes, the process of rapprochement would have commenced. And eventually it might have happened, if we had seen some sincere wish on the other side of our partners. But it didn't happen. Well, no means no. Okay, fine. Why do you think that is? Just to get to motive, I know you're clearly bitter about it. Um, I understand. But why do you think the West rebuffed you then? Why the hostility? Why did the end of the Cold War not fix the relationship? What motivates this from your point of view? You said I was bitter about the answer. No, it's not bitterness. It's just a statement of fact. We're not bride and groom, bitterness, resentment. It's not about those kind of matters in such circumstances. We just realized we weren't welcome there, that's all. Okay, fine. But let's build relations in another manner. Let's work for common ground elsewhere. Why we received such a negative response, you should ask your leaders. I can only guess why. Too big a country with its own opinion and so on. And the United States, I've seen how issues are being resolved in NATO. I will give you another example now concerning Ukraine. The U.S. leadership exerts pressure and all NATO members obediently vote, even if they do not like something. Now, I'll tell you what happened in this regard with Ukraine in 2008, although it's being discussed. I'm not going to open a secret to you, say anything new. Nevertheless, after that we tried to build relations in different ways. For example, the events in the Middle East, in Iraq. We were building relations with the United States in a very soft, prudent, cautious manner. I repeatedly raised the issue that the United States should not support separatism or terrorism in the North Caucasus but they continue to do it anyway. And political support, information support, financial support, even military support came from the United States and its satellites for terrorist groups in the Caucasus. I once raised this issue with my colleague, also the President of the United States. He says, it's impossible, do you have proof? I said, yes. I was prepared for this conversation, and I gave him that proof. He looked at it, and you know what he said? I apologize, but that's what happened. I'll quote. He says, well, I'm gonna kick their ass. We waited and waited for some response. There was no reply. I said to the FSB director, write to the CIA, what is the result of the conversation with President? He wrote once, twice, and then we got a reply. We have the answer in the archive. The CIA replied, we have been working with the opposition in Russia, we believe that this is the right thing to do, and we will keep on doing it. Just ridiculous. Well, okay, we realized that it was out of the question. Forces in opposition to you. So you're saying the CIA is trying to overthrow your government. Of course, they meant in that particular case the separatists, the terrorists who fought with us in the Caucasus. That's who they called the opposition. This is the second point. 
The third moment is a very important one, is the moment when the U.S. missile defense system was created. The beginning. We persuaded for a long time not to do it in the United States. Moreover, after was invited by Bush Jr.'s father, Bush Sr., to visit his place on the ocean, I had a very serious conversation with President Bush and his team. I proposed that the United States, Russia and Europe jointly create a missile defense system. Oh, I'm lonely this winter I'm fulfilling the wish of The laughing being I don't know That would hold for me to be alone I'm lonely this winter that we believe, if created unilaterally, threatens our security, despite the fact that the United States officially said that it was being created against missile threats from Iran. That was the justification for the deployment of the missile defense system. I suggested working together, Russia, the United States and Europe. They said it was very interesting. They asked me, are you serious? I said, absolutely. Let me ask, what year was this? I don't remember. It is easy to find out on the Internet when I was in the USA at the invitation of a Bush senior. It is even easier to learn from someone I'm going to tell you about. I was told it was very interesting. I said, just imagine if we could tackle such a global strategic security challenge together. The world will change. We'll probably have disputes, probably economic and even political ones, but we could drastically change the situation in the world. He says yes, and asks, are you serious? I said, of course. We need to think about it, I'm told. I said, go ahead, please. Then Secretary of Defense Gates, former director of CIA and Secretary of State Rice came in here, in this cabinet, right here at this table. They sat on this table. Me, the foreign minister, the Russian defense minister on that side, they said to me, yes, we have thought about it, we agree. I said, thank God, great, but with some exceptions. So twice you've described U.S. presidents making decisions and then being undercut by their agency heads. So it sounds like you're describing a system that's not run by the people who are elected in your telling. That's right, that's right. In the end, they just told us to get lost. I'm not going to tell you the details because I think it's incorrect. After all, it was confidential conversation. But our proposal was declined, that's a fact. It was right then when I said, look, but then we will be forced to take countermeasures. We will create such strike systems that will certainly overcome missile defense systems. The answer was, we are not doing this against you and you do what you want, assuming that it is not against us, not against the United States. I said, okay. Very well. That's the way it went. And we created hypersonic systems with intercontinental range, and we continue to develop them. We are now ahead of everyone, the United States and the other countries, in terms of the development of hypersonic strike systems, and we are improving them every day. But it wasn't us. We proposed to go the other way and we were pushed back. Now, about NATO's expansion to the east. Well, we were promised no NATO to the east, not an inch to the east, as we were told. And then what? They said, well, it's not enshrined on paper, so we'll expand. So there were five waves of expansion, the Baltic states, the whole of Eastern Europe, and so on. And now I come to the main thing. They have come to the Ukraine, ultimately. Hungary. In 2008, at the summit in Bucharest, they declared that the doors for Ukraine and Georgia to join NATO were open. Now about how decisions are made there. Germany, France seem to be against it, as well as some other European countries. But then, as it turned out, later President Bush, and he's such a tough guy, a tough politician, as I was told later, 
He exerted pressure on us and we had to agree. It's ridiculous, it's like kindergarten. Where are the guarantees? What kindergarten is this? What kind of people are these? Who are they? You see, they were pressed, they agree. And then they say, Ukraine won't be in the NATO, you know? I say, I don't know. I know you agreed in 2008. Why won't you agree in the future? Well, they pressed us then. I say, why won't they press you tomorrow? And you'll agree again. Well, it's nonsensical. Who's there to talk to? I just don't understand. We're ready to talk. But with whom? Where are the guarantees? None. So they started... Okay, from my understanding of this, uh, what he's saying right now, from my understanding is that he, the, in America they elected the president, right? And then the president give his speech, his promises and stuff like this, and when he reached he become president now he need to bow for the most higher power than him i wish it, i wish if i'm speaking about that the most higher power than him it's allah i wish that it was but no it's just other human beings above him that's all and they go he going to do what they are saying uh, from my understanding of this to develop the territory I don't know of ukraine Whatever is there, I have told you the background, how this territory developed, what kind of relations there were with Russia. Every second or third person there has always had some ties with Russia. And during the elections in already independent sovereign Ukraine, which gained its independence as a result of the declaration of independence. Okay. And by the way, it says that Ukraine is a neutral state and in 2008 suddenly the doors or gates to NATO were open to it. Oh, come on. This is not how we agreed. Now all the presidents that have come to power in Ukraine, they relied on electorate with a good attitude to Russia in one way or the other. This is the southeast of Ukraine. This is a large number of people. And it was very difficult to dissuade this electorate, which had a positive attitude towards Russia. Viktor Yanukovych came to power and how? The first time he won after President Kuchma, they organized a third round, which is not provided for in the constitution of Ukraine. This is a coup d'etat. Just imagine, someone in the United States wouldn't like the outcome. In 2014? Before that. No, this oh, was before really? that. After President Kuchma, Viktor Yanukovych won the elections. However, his opponents did not recognize that victory. The U.S. supported the opposition and the third round was scheduled. What is this? This is a coup. The U.S. supported it and the winner of the third round came to power. Imagine if in the U.S. something was not to someone's liking and the third round of election, which the U.S. Constitution does not provide for, was organized. Nonetheless, it was done in Ukraine. Okay, Viktor Yushchenko, who was considered a pro-Western politician, came to power. Fine, we have built relations with him as well. He came to Moscow with visits. We visited Kiev. I visited too. We met in an informal setting. If he's pro-Western, so be it. It's fine. Let people do their job. The situation should have developed inside the independent Ukraine itself. As a result of Kuchma's leadership, things got worse and Viktor Yanukovych came to power after all. Maybe he wasn't the best president and politician. I don't know. I don't want to give assessments. However, the issue of the association with the EU came up. We have always been lenient to this. Suit yourself. But when we read through the three... Putin is speaking some, some stuff that we never heard about them, guys. That's why I'm telling you, if you want to check the truth, check it from the mouth of who, who, who started it all. And why he started it. You, if you want to have answers, that's why you find answers, guys. If you don't want to have answers, if you don't care about the truth, then don't, don't care about the truth and keep searching from here and here and here. But I recommend you to, every time you want to hear the truth, hear it from the mouth of the one and only. You know what I mean?
not third party, only two. There is two people who speak. There is nothing third about it. There is some stuff that I never heard about them and he's speaking them. I know about them, but you don't know what is hiding. You know what I guys, you, you know everything what is going on, but you don't know what is hiding. Because politician always like... It turned out to be a problem for us since we had a free trade zone and open customs borders with Ukraine which under this association had to open its borders for Europe, which could have led to flooding of our market. We said, no, this is not going to work. We shall close our borders with Ukraine then. The customs borders, that is. Yanukovych started to calculate how much Ukraine was going to gain, how much to lose, and said to his European partners, I need more time to think before signing. The moment he said that, the opposition began to take destructive steps which were supported by the West. It all came down to Maidan and a coup in Ukraine. So he did more trade with Russia than with the EU? Ukraine did? Of course. It's not even the matter of trade volume, although for the most part it is. It is the matter of cooperation ties, which the entire Ukrainian economy was based on. The cooperation ties between the enterprises were very close since the times of the Soviet Union. One enterprise there used to produce components to be assembled both in Russia and Ukraine and vice versa. They used to be very close ties. A coup d'etat was committed, although I shall not delve into details now, as I find doing it inappropriate, the US told us. Calm Yanukovych down and we will calm the opposition. Let the situation unfold in the scenario of a political settlement. We said, all right, agreed, let's do it this way. As the Americans requested, Yanukovych did use neither the armed forces nor the police Yet the armed opposition committed a coup in Kiev. What is that supposed to mean? Who do you think you are? I wanted to ask the then US leadership. With the backing of whom? With the backing of CIA, of course. The organization you wanted to join back in the day, as I understand. We should thank God they didn't let you in. Although, it is a serious organization, I understand. My former vis-a-vis -vis in the sense that I served in the first main directorate, Soviet Union's intelligence service. They have always been our opponents. A job is a job. Technically, they did everything right. They achieved their goal of changing the government. However, from a political standpoint, it was a colossal mistake. Surely it was political leadership's miscalculation. They should have seen what it would evolve into. So, in 2008, the doors of NATO were opened for Ukraine. In 2014, there was a coup. They started persecuting those who did not accept the coup. And it was indeed a coup. They created the threat to Crimea, which we had to take under our protection. They launched the war in Donbas in 2014 with the use of aircraft and artillery against civilians. This is when it all started. There is a video of aircraft attacking Donetsk from above. They launched a large-scale military operation, then another one. When they failed, they started to prepare the next one. All this against the background of military development of this territory and opening of NATO's doors. How could we not 